Friend, this is Rick Renner, and it is such a privilege that today I can discuss with you the ministries of apostles and prophets. And what I'm going to be sharing is just a little piece from my brand new book, which is called Apostles and Prophets, Their Roles in the Past, in the Present, and in the Last Days. God's intention is that the ministries of apostles and prophets be with us all the way to the end of the church age. But I'll tell you something funny about this book. When I sat down to write it, I thought it would be about 150 or 180 pages, but look at it. It is quite a significant book because when I really began to dive deep into the subject, I found so much material in the New Testament and a lot of material written by early church leaders about the ministries of apostles and prophets. And I really wanted to write the go-to book on this subject because there's so many questions and controversy about who is an apostle and who is a prophet. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Bad theology and a misuse of terminology makes a mess for everyone. And today I'm going to talk to you about some bad theology and a misuse of terminology. But I want to begin by reading to you from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, where the Apostle Paul writes about Christ. And he says, And he, Christ, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. But I want you to notice something in this verse. The word some appears over and over and over. And in the Greek text, it's the little Greek word men, which describes something that is emphatic, something that is categorical, something that is not to be questioned. You could translate it for indeed, categorically, emphatically. He really gave some to be apostles. And indeed, categorically, emphatically, he really gave some to be prophets. And indeed, categorically, emphatically, he gave some to be evangelists. And indeed, categorically, emphatically, he gave some to be pastors and teachers. The little use of that word men is really important because it lets us know these gifts are not to be questioned. Christ gave them indeed. He gave them categorically. He gave them emphatically beyond any shadow of a doubt. Christ gave these fivefold ministry gifts to the church. And how long they are to work in the church is described in the following verse for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, then verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And according to verse 14, if these fivefold ministry gifts, including the apostle and the prophet, are functioning properly in the church, it brings us spiritual maturity. That's why verse 14 says that we henceforth be no more children. So according to these verses, we need these gifts in order to reach spiritual maturity. But there's a lot of bad theology about apostles and prophets and a lot of misusing of terminology. And that's what I want to address right now. And I'll begin with how I grew up. I grew up in a wonderful denominational church that really taught me the Bible. And I'm so glad for the church that I grew up in. But we had one issue of bad theology. We didn't believe in the current day usage of spiritual gifts or of apostles and prophets. Now, it's interesting that we believed in pastors, we believed in teachers, we believed in evangelists, but when it came to the subject of apostles and prophets, we said, no, 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 no. They ended with the closure of the apostolic age. And we really believed that when the last of the first 12 apostles died, that was it. The chapter was closed. There were no more apostles and there was no such thing as a modern day prophet. We were technically what is called cessationists comes from the word cease, which means we believe these things ceased at the end of the age. Now today, I am what is called a continuationist, which means I believe these gifts have continued and will continue until the coming of Jesus. Say amen, because I know you believe that too. But we really were dyed in the wool cessationists. When we heard that somebody was speaking in tongues, we just thought it was gibberish. When somebody talked about the gifts of the Spirit, we thought they were silly and uninformed and had bad doctrine. We laughed at them. In fact, I can remember as a boy driving past a Pentecostal church near our denominational church. And when we would drive past that church, I remember feeling like, ugh, it should just be shunned. These were low level, low culture, 
unintelligent, uneducated Pentecostals who just believed in a bunch of silly stuff and what they believed in was based on bad doctrine. We just did not believe in the continuation of all the fivefold ministry gifts and all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We just didn't believe it. We had bad theology. And due to very educated ancestors in the church around the 1500s, the word apostle was replaced with the word missionary. Well, missionaries are good. In fact, I'm from a family of missionaries. I have great respect for missionaries. I believe they are heroic. But a missionary is not necessarily an apostle. He might be, but not necessarily. A missionary is a person that's been dispatched by the church on a mission, and usually it's of a temporary nature. But the word missionary replaced the word apostle, and this was very unfortunate. And then we kind of lost the meaning of the word apostle. And in the next program, I'm going to be talking to you about the real meaning of the word apostle. We need to come back to the basic original meaning of that word. But what we believed was really based on a lot of bad theology. And if somebody had said, for example, that they were an apostle, we would have laughed our heads off. And I probably would have taken it as something insulting to the original 12. How dare this person call themselves an apostle? I would have found that to be very offensive. But now we've gone all the way to the other end of the spectrum where it seems like everybody's being called an apostle and everybody is being called a prophet. And my friends, all the people being called apostles are not necessarily apostles. And everybody who now has the label of prophet is not necessarily a prophet. You have to understand that you can be apostolic without being an apostle. An apostolic person is a person who has a heart for starting churches. He wants to be involved in the process of starting churches. And maybe he's called to work with an apostle, but he's just apostolic. That doesn't mean he is an apostle. You can be prophetic without being a prophet. There's a difference between a prophet and just being prophetic. Some people easily move in the gift of prophecy. That does not make them a prophet. Or they have a tendency towards supernatural things. That does not make them a prophet. They're prophetic, but that does not necessarily mean they are a prophet. Likewise, some people really have a heart for the lost, but they're not five-fold ministry evangelists. Well, we should all have a heart for the lost. But having a heart for the lost alone does not qualify you to be a five-fold ministry evangelist. There's a difference between the two. You may have a heart for teaching. You love the Bible. You love to share truths from the Word of God. That does not qualify you to be a Christ-given five-fold ministry teacher. You're just a person who has an inkling for teaching, and that's wonderful. Maybe you're supposed to be helping a five-fold ministry teacher. And in the same way, there are many people who have a heart for helping others, but that does not make them a five-fold ministry pastor. And the problem is today, people are calling themselves apostles because they have an apostolic heart. People are labeling themselves or being labeled by others as prophets because they have a prophetic tendency. And my friends, this really creates a mess for everyone. And I'm really convinced that part of the problem is people have not had clear, concise, solid teaching about what really is an apostle and what is a prophet. If people really understood what these terms meant, they would not so easily apply this label to themselves or others would not call people by these names so easily. The word apostle is a very serious word, as is the word prophet. But today we're living in an environment where it seems like Everybody is an apostle and everybody is a prophet. In fact, if you open ministry magazines and read all the advertisements, it's quite shocking. Prophet this, prophet this, apostle this, apostle that. And I personally believe that if the apostle Paul were here and he saw all those advertisements, he would say, ay, 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 what in the world is this? There's no way all these people really are bona fide apostles and prophets, but this problem is not new because when we come to Revelation chapter 2, we find that in the city of Ephesus, a lot of people were showing up claiming to be apostles who were not. So this has always been a problem.
But when you come to Revelation chapter 2, Jesus said to the church of Ephesus, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. Now listen to this. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. By the way, in this verse, when Jesus said thou canst not bear, the word bear is a Greek word which means you just cannot bear putting your endorsement or your seal of approval on people before you really know they're the real deal. You cannot bear them that are evil, and you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not. The word tried is a form of a Greek word which means to really put through the fire to see if that thing being tested is genuine or not. And it means so many people were showing up in Ephesus claiming to be apostles. That's what we just read in this verse. That the leadership of Ephesus, who really loved and respected the apostolic gift, the real gift, in order to protect the integrity of the real gift, they developed a criteria to test all these people showing up to see if they were the real deal or not. It wasn't because they were suspicious. It's because they really respected the real apostolic gift and wanted to protect its integrity. So when people just showed up randomly and easily and said, hey, I'm a new apostle, they developed a criteria to determine whether or not that person really was an apostle or not. They tried them. And the Greek word means they really put them through the fire. It's a Greek word which actually means to put through three degrees of fire. And it's where we get the phrase, would you please stop putting me through the third degree? That is how intensely they were testing these people who claim to be apostles. And Jesus says, you have found them liars. The word found is a form of the Greek word eureka. And eureka, after all your testing, Eureka, you discovered they are not. In fact, he says, you have found them to be liars. Well, in 2 Corinthians, verse 12, the Apostle Paul talks about false apostles. It's the Greek word pseudo-apostolos, from the word pseude, which describes something that is false, something that is bogus, or something that is pretend. You could actually translate it bogus apostles or pretend apostles. And according to the Apostle Paul, even when he was writing the New Testament, this was a problem. People were pretend apostles, wannabe apostles, but in fact they were bogus apostles. And this was hurting the reputation of real apostles. So the early church, particularly the leadership of Ephesus, said, hey, we have to develop a criteria so we can determine who is and who is not. And it was very easy for them to do that because the church of Ephesus had been birthed in apostolic ministry. They'd been birthed under the ministry of the Apostle Paul with his apostolic team, Aquila and Priscilla. The three of them together birthed with the power of God, the church in Ephesus. So the church in Ephesus knew real apostolic ministry, so they knew how to develop a criteria to test others who were showing up saying, I'm an apostle too. But if they had that problem in the first century, well, we still have the same problem today. And if we understand the criteria they use, then we'll know the criteria to use. And if we understand the word apostle as the ears in the first century understood the word apostle, it will bring a lot of clarity to this subject about who is an apostle and who is not. But again, Tell you, a lot of people are calling themselves apostles that are not, or they're being called apostles sincerely by others, but wrongly. And most people think that an apostle is a pioneer or someone who has done something new. He's an innovator. But being an innovator and being a pioneer does not make you an apostle. An apostle is very specifically somebody who gives birth to new churches with the power of God. That is the context of the word apostle. And if a person has not started churches, I say plural, not just one, because just starting one church does not make you an apostle. But if a person has not started churches or is responsible for churches, plural, he simply is not an apostle. Maybe he has good ideas. Maybe he really is a pioneer. And we kind of use the word apostle as a badge of respect to say, wow, that is really a groundbreaking person. That is a confusion of terms and it makes a mess for everybody. So we need to know what 
the word apostle really means. And that's what I'm going to tell you when we come back. 